Being home alone for the weekend was supposed to be a taste of freedom, a chance to relish the solitude that comes with an empty house. My parents had gone on a spontaneous trip, leaving me, a 17-year-old, in charge. It was a responsibility I'd yearned for, but it would soon turn into a nightmare I could never forget. The first night alone, I relished the quiet. I ordered pizza, watched my favorite movies, and even dared to venture into the darkness of our sprawling old house to enjoy the solitude. Everything seemed perfectly ordinary until I decided to go to bed. As I lay in my room, the house seemed to come alive with eerie sounds, creaking floorboards, distant whispers, and odd, unidentifiable noises. I told myself it was just my imagination playing tricks on me, a side effect of being alone in a large, creaky house. But then came the knocking, three soft taps on my bedroom window. I sat up, my heart pounding, and turned on the bedside lamp. There on the other side of the glass was a pale, gaunt face staring in at me. I screamed, and the face disappeared as quickly as it had come. Trembling, I grabbed my phone and dialed 911. The police arrived promptly, but there was no sign of an intruder. They assured me it was likely a prank, a local teenager trying to spook me. I tried to believe them, but the unease settled in my stomach like a heavy stone. The second night was worse. I locked all the doors and windows, but that didn't stop the whispers that seemed to emanate from the walls themselves. The temperature dropped, and I could see my breath in the air. It felt as though the very house had turned against me. I kept my bedroom light on, refusing to venture into the darkness. But sleep eluded me, and when I did drift off, it was into a fitful nightmare. I was chased through the house by shadowy figures, their whispers growing louder and more menacing with each passing second. Morning came as a relief, and I spent the day outside, away from the oppressive atmosphere of the house. But as the sun dipped below the horizon, dread crept back in. I couldn't escape the feeling of being washed. That night, the knocking returned, louder and more insistent. I mustered the courage to look out the window. But this time, there was no face, just darkness. As I turned away, I saw it, a shadowy figure in the corner of my room, its eyes gleaming with malevolence. It moved closer, its icy fingers grazing my skin. I screamed, and the figure dissipated, leaving me gasping for breath. With my heart pounding, I grabbed my phone and called my parents. They rushed home, concern etched on their faces as they listened to my frantic account of the past two nights. They promised to stay with me until we figured out what was happening. As we sat in the living room, the house seemed to sigh in relief the oppressive presence lifting. I knew I would never forget those terrifying nights home alone, and I couldn't help but wonder what unseen horrors still lurked within the walls of that old house. The sun had dipped below the horizon, casting the highway into a dark, ominous corridor. I was on my way home after a long day at work, eager to put the hours of traffic and stress behind me. Little did I know that the drive home would become a nightmarish descent into road rage. Traffic crawled along the narrow, two-lane road, and my patience wore thin. I had been stuck behind a sluggish driver for miles, their brake lights flickering like an irritating metronome. My fingers drummed on the steering wheel as frustration simmered beneath the surface. Finally, an opportunity to pass presented itself. The road straightened out, and I accelerated leaving the slowpoke in the rearview mirror. But as I passed, I couldn't resist a glance, a scowl, a raised middle finger. It was a momentary lapse in judgment, a reaction to the pent-up anger that had been building all day. That's when the nightmare began. The driver I'd passed suddenly surged forward, their car tailgating me with a vengeance. The headlights filled my rearview mirror, blinding me with their intensity. Panic set in as I tried to shake them off, but no matter how fast I drove, they clung to my bumper, their car an unrelenting shadow in the night. I darted into the right lane, hoping they would pass, but they stayed on my tail, their horn blaring and their high beams blinding me. It felt like a relentless assault, a storm of anger and aggression directed squarely at me. 
My heart raced, and I dialed 911, desperately relaying my location to the dispatcher. She assured me that help was on the way, but my terror only grew as the minutes passed. The driver behind me seemed relentless, their rage unquenched. As I approached an upcoming intersection, I knew I had to make a decision. Run a red light and risk a collision, or stop and face the unknown wrath of my tormentor. I chose the latter, slamming on my brakes as the light turned red. The driver behind me did the same, their car inches from my bumper. That's when I saw them in the rearview mirror, an enraged figure in the driver's seat, their face contorted with anger, eyes wild with fury. They reached over to the passenger seat, and I glimpsed the glint of metal, a weapon. With adrenaline surging through my veins, I made a split-second decision. I veered to the side, swerving onto the shoulder of the road and accelerating as I left the intersection behind. The pursuing car screeched to a halt, unable to follow. Minutes later, the police arrived, and I pulled over to recount the horrifying ordeal. They searched for the aggressor but found no trace of them. The officer offered me a reassuring smile, suggesting that it might have been a case of road rage gone too far. But I knew it was something more, something primal and terrifying, a relentless anger that had threatened to consume both of us on that dark highway. To this day, I still look over my shoulder when I drive alone at night, haunted by the memory of those headlights and the face of pure rage that lurked behind them. I had always relished the idea of being left home alone. It felt like a rite of passage, a taste of independence that every teenager craved. My parents had planned a weekend getaway, leaving me, a 16-year-old, with the house to myself. Little did I know that those two nights would become the most harrowing experience of my life. The house was quiet when they left, and I reveled in the solitude. I had the whole place to myself, complete with a fully stocked kitchen and a Netflix queue to conquer. The first evening passed without incident. I ordered takeout, binged a TV series, and drifted to sleep with a sense of contentment. It was the middle of the night when I woke up to an eerie sensation. The house was shrouded in silence, an unsettling void that made my heart race. I glanced at my phone. 3.33 m. The witching hour. As I lay there, trying to shake off the unease, I heard it. A soft, rhythmic tapping coming from somewhere downstairs. My mind raced to rationalize the sound, perhaps a loose window pane or a branch brushing against the house. But the tapping was too deliberate, too methodical. Summoning every ounce of courage, I tipped it downstairs, clutching a baseball bat for reassurance. The tapping grew louder, leading me to the kitchen. I flicked on the lights and froze. The sound wasn't coming from outside, it was coming from the back door, where the glass was fogged over. I approached cautiously and saw a handprint on the glass, outlined in a crimson substance that sent chills down my spine. I could feel panic rising within me, but I had to see what was on the other side. With trembling hands, I slowly unlocked the door and pulled it open. There, standing in the moonlight, was a man in tattered clothes, his face obscured by shadows. He was tapping a long, slender knife against the glass with a manic intensity. My voice failed me as I watched in horror. The intruder seemed unfazed by my presence, his gaze locked onto mine. Without a word, he began etching something onto the glass with the knife, his movements deliberate and methodical. I stumbled back and ran to the phone, dialing 911 with trembling fingers. The operator assured me that help was on the way, but as I hung up, I heard a shattering sound from the kitchen. The man had broken the glass and was now inside the house. I fled upstairs, locking myself in my room and barricading the door with a dresser. Tears streamed down my face as I heard the intruder's footsteps growing closer, his knife scraping against the walls as he moved. Minutes felt like hours as I cowered in the darkness, praying for the police to arrive. When they finally did, the house echoed with a scream that chilled my bones. The officers apprehended the intruder, who had been hiding in a closet just a few feet from my room. It turned out the man was deranged, 
a complete stranger who had targeted our house at random. He was armed with ill intentions, and I had been mere moments away from a horrifying fate. My parents returned home to find me shaken but alive. From that day on, the idea of being left home alone held a different meaning for me. It was a reminder of the thin line between safety and danger, a lesson in the darkness that can lurk just beyond our comfortable lives. It was a chilly autumn evening, and I was driving home through a desolate stretch of road that cut through a dense forest. The setting sun cast long, eerie shadows across the asphalt, and the fading light made me feel a sense of urgency to reach home. As I navigated a particularly winding section of the road, I spotted a figure up ahead, a hitchhiker standing by the roadside, their thumb extended, a backpack slung over one shoulder. It was a sight not often seen in this remote area, but something about the person's forlorn posture tugged at my conscience. I decided to stop and offer them a ride. As I pulled over, I noticed the hitchhiker was a young woman with disheveled hair and worn clothing. She thanked me profusely as she climbed into the passenger seat. Her voice was soft, and she seemed nervous, constantly glancing out the window as if she were being pursued. She introduced herself as Sarah and explained that her car had broken down a few miles back, leaving her stranded in the growing darkness. She looked anxious, and I couldn't help but feel a twinge of unease, but I dismissed it as my own paranoia and continued driving. We exchanged small talk during the journey, and Sarah seemed pleasant enough. However, her conversation took an unsettling turn when she began asking oddly specific questions about my route and schedule. She wanted to know where I lived and whether I lived alone. I grew increasingly uncomfortable, sensing that something was amiss. It was then that I noticed the glint of a small, sharp object hidden beneath the folds of her jacket. My heart pounded in my chest as I realized the truth. This seemingly innocent hitchhiker might have had sinister intentions all along. I decided to feign a pit stop at a gas station, pretending I needed to fill up the tank. As I pulled into the station, I subtly dialed 911 on my phone, concealing it from Sarah's view. I needed to get her out of my car without alerting her to my suspicions. Hey, I just remembered. I have a friend who lives nearby. I said, my voice trembling. I can drop you off there, and she can help you out. Sarah hesitated but eventually agreed, and I could see a flicker of annoyance in her eyes. As we pulled into the gas station, I pretended to park, but instead, I jumped out of the car and sprinted toward the station's attendants, telling them to call the police. The attendants did as I asked, and I watched as two police cars sped into the station, sirens blaring. Sarah, realizing her plan had unraveled, made a run for it. She darted away from the gas station and disappeared into the darkness of the woods, never to be seen again. The police arrived and took my statement assuring me that they would search for the hitchhiker. They told me I had made a potentially life-saving decision by stopping at the gas station. That night, as I finally made it home, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that had settled in the pit of my stomach. I had narrowly escaped a dangerous encounter with a hitchhiker who had not been in need of assistance, but harbored something far more sinister. It was a chilling reminder that sometimes, the kindness of strangers can mask the darkest intentions. The eerie moonlight filtered through the dense canopy of ancient oaks as I trudged deeper into the forest, my flashlight the only beacon in the enveloping darkness. My footsteps crunched on fallen leaves, their sound a haunting reminder of my isolation. I had always been drawn to the mysterious, the unknown, and tonight, I was about to confront something beyond my wildest nightmares. The forest was silent, unnaturally so. The usual chorus of night creatures had fallen silent, as if the very woods held its breath, anticipating the horror that awaited. I should have turned back, should have heeded the warnings of the locals who spoke of this place in hushed tones. But my curiosity was insatiable, and my desire to uncover the truth pushed me forward. My research had led me here, to the heart of the forest, where a small dilapidated cabin was said to hold the secrets of a dark and twisted history. As I approached, the air grew colder, 
and a shiver ran down my spine. The cabin loomed before me, a decrepit relic of a forgotten time, its windows shattered, and its roof sagging under the weight of years. I stepped inside cautiously, my flashlight revealing a scene of unimaginable horror. The walls were adorned with crude symbols, a mosaic of malevolence that seemed to pulse with a sinister energy. In the corner, I spotted an old journal, its pages yellowed with age. It was written in a language I couldn't decipher, but the illustrations that accompanied the text were unmistakable. Grotesque creatures, contorted and monstrous. As I continued to explore the cabin, my unease grew. Strange whispers echoed in the darkness, and the feeling of being watched became overwhelming. I heard footsteps, soft and deliberate, moving closer to me. Panic gripped my chest, and I turned to flee, but the door slammed shut with a deafening crash, sealing me inside. Trapped, I could feel the presence drawing near, an oppressive malevolence that seemed to radiate from the very walls themselves. The symbols on the walls began to glow with an otherworldly light, and the air grew thick with a foul stench. I clutched the journal, desperately searching for answers. The pages of the journal came to life before my eyes, the text shifting and changing until it was in a language I could understand. It spoke of dark rituals performed in this very cabin, of a cult that worshipped ancient, eldritch beings from another realm. It described sacrifices and unspeakable acts that had taken place here, all in the name of power and immortality. The whispers grew louder, their voices filled with malice and hunger. I knew then that I was not alone. Something had been summoned by my intrusion, something that hungered for my soul. In a desperate attempt to escape, I recited the incantation from the journal, hoping to reverse the sinister forces at play. But as the last word left my lips, the cabin shook violently, and the walls began to close in on me. I screamed in terror as the darkness consumed me, and the world I knew faded away. To this day, they say the forest is cursed, that those who venture too close to the cabin are never seen again. But I know the truth, for I am trapped within the very walls of that accursed place, a prisoner of my own insatiable curiosity, doomed to forever bear witness to the horrors of the past and the malevolent entities that dwell there, waiting for the next unsuspecting soul to cross their path. It was a sunny Saturday morning when I stumbled upon the garage sale. Rows of mismatched items were spread out on folding tables beneath a faded blue canopy. I wasn't looking for anything in particular, just hoping to find a hidden gem among the clutter. That's when I saw her, a porcelain doll with soulless, glassy eyes that seemed to follow me as I approached. The doll was exquisite, wearing a faded lavender dress adorned with delicate lace. Her porcelain skin was flawless, and her golden ringlets framed a face frozen in a serene expression. I couldn't resist the eerie elder of the doll, and I asked the elderly woman running the sale about her. Oh, that old thing, the woman said with a shiver. It belonged to my daughter, but she was always afraid of it, said it gave her nightmares. It's yours for five dollars if you want it. I couldn't believe my luck. I handed over the five dollars and took the doll, feeling a strange thrill of excitement mixed with unease. I carried her home, carefully placing her on a shelf in my bedroom. That night, I couldn't sleep. I kept tossing and turning, feeling as though something was watching me. The moonlight filtered through the curtains, casting an eerie glow in the room. My eyes were drawn to the doll, and for a moment, I could have sworn her expression had changed. It was no longer serene. Now she wore a faint, sinister smile. Chalking it up to my imagination, I tried to ignore the uneasy feeling settling in the pit of my stomach. But as the days passed, strange things began to happen. Objects went missing only to reappear in the doll's lap. I would find her in different positions each morning, as if she had moved on her own. Then the nightmare started. Vivid, terrifying dreams in which the doll came to life, her porcelain face contorting into a malevolent grin as she whispered dark secrets in my ear. I woke up drenched in sweat, convinced that the doll was to blame. Desperate to rid myself of this sinister presence, 
I decided to return the doll to the garage sale where I had found her. The elderly woman was surprised to see me again so soon. I can't keep this doll, I confessed, my voice trembling. It's causing nightmares, and I feel like I'm losing my mind. The woman nodded knowingly. I've heard stories like that before. It's why I was selling it so cheap. It's been in my family for generations, and no one could ever get rid of it for long. But if you're sure, I'll take it back. Relieved, I handed the doll over, feeling an overwhelming sense of liberation as I watched the woman place it back on her table. As I walked away, I couldn't help but glance back at the doll one last time. It was then that I saw her eyes move, following me as I left. Weeks passed, and the nightmares finally ceased. I tried to forget about the doll, but I couldn't shake the feeling that it was still out there, waiting for its next unsuspecting victim. The sinister smile it had worn haunted my dreams, a reminder of the true horror that had lurked behind its porcelain facade. I had always been a skeptic, scoffing at tales of the supernatural and dismissing ghost stories as mere fantasies. But that was before I moved into the old Victorian house on Willow Street. It was a grand, imposing structure with turrets and stained glass windows, a true relic of a bygone era. Little did I know that it held secrets far more chilling than anything I could have imagined. The first sign that something was amiss came on the very first night. I was alone in the house, unpacking boxes and trying to make the place feel like home. As I climbed the creaky staircase to the second floor, I heard it, a faint, mournful wailing that sent shivers down my spine. I told myself it was just the wind, but the sound was too human, too full of sorrow. The following nights brought more disturbances. Footsteps echoed in empty rooms, doors slammed shut of their own accord and objects move as if guided by unseen hands. I tried to rationalize it all, blaming it on the house's age and quirks, but deep down, I knew there was something darker at play. Then the dreams began. Every night, I found myself standing in a dark, shadowy corridor within the house. At the end of the corridor, a door beckoned me. Each night, I drew closer, compelled by an irresistible force, and each night, just as I was about to reach the door, I woke up in a cold sweat. One evening, as I sat alone in the dimly lit living room, I heard a whisper, a voice so faint it was almost imperceptible. It called my name, a plaintive, echoing plea. My heart raced as I followed the voice, its ethereal quality leading me through the labyrinthine halls of the house. The voice led me to the attic, a place I had avoided since moving in. The attic door creaked open on its own, revealing a room filled with dusty relics of the past. In the center of the room stood an old, ornate mirror, its glass tarnished with age. It was then that I saw her, a woman in a tattered white gown, her reflection mirroring my own. She reached out to me, her spectral hand passing through the glass. I could feel her sorrow and longing, a presence trapped between worlds. It was as if she were begging for release from a torment that had bound her for centuries. In a moment of impulse, I touched the mirror, and a searing pain shot through my body. I screamed as I felt myself being pulled into the mirror, my world dissolving into darkness. I awoke in the same corridor from my dreams, but this time, the door at the end was open. I stepped through it, and suddenly, I was standing in a beautiful garden bathed in golden light. The woman in the white gown stood before me, her face radiant with joy. She whispered her thanks and faded away, her spirit finally finding peace. I returned to the real world, back in the attic of the old Victorian house. The disturbances had ceased, and the house felt different, lighter somehow. I had helped a tormented soul find release, and in doing so, I had become a believer in the supernatural. Now. I share my story with those who will listen, a cautionary tale of skepticism, turned to belief, and the inexplicable mysteries that can lie hidden behind the walls of even the most ordinary seeming places.